Hi, my name is Dan, and today I'd like to present our work titled A Full Stack Search Technique for Domain Optimized Deep Learning Accelerators. So at a high level, you can think about accelerator performance as a function of its hardware data path, which includes components such as ALUs, scratch pads, uh, interconnect, etc., and how workloads are mapped onto that data path. Traditionally, with design space acceleration, it only typically optimizes the hardware data path. This can be a major limitation if some data path variant that you're testing is violating assumptions made by your compiler scheduling heuristic. With FAST, we're able to simultaneously optimize not just the data path, but also scheduling and other compiler decisions. This has a potentially very large search space up to order 10 to the 2300 when fully unconstrained. We can optimize not just performance for a single workload, but also small sets of workloads. Also in the paper, we show that we can use FAST to automatically address bottlenecks in emerging ML workloads. So at a high level, our approach uh, operates in three phases. So first, our black box optimizer, we use Google Vizier, proposes a specific point within the data path search space, along with some scheduling constraints. Next, we have augmented our architectural simulator with time loop, which is able to perform per op scheduling. Once all the ops have been modeled, then um, you can run the app fast fusion pass, which um, determines you know, which op tensors are to be fused. This has order 10 to 300 search space. This produces an end-to-end -end performance and power estimate, which is then passed back to Vizier. And Vizier uses that information to propose the next point. So this then repeats until convergence. So our goal with the data path was design an approximate superset template, which is capable of expressing a wide range of accelerators that we saw both in academia and in industry, such as Iris, and as well as a Google TPU design. So we propose a very common you know, sea of processing elements where each processing element has some amount of compute, some memory, and there may or may not be a global memory. So we use the systolic array to model the compute, but you can also model both scalar and vector processing elements by setting the systolic array dimensions to one. These memory model, uh, these memory levels are all optional and can be either private or shared. So private means that each uh, type of tensor, such as your input activations, output activations, and weights, each have their own separate memories, or they can be shared, where all three types share the same memory. So for example, with the iris design, you'd set your systolic array dimensions to one, you set your L1 memory to the uh, to a private, uh, you would configure them as appropriately, you would disable L2 memory and you have a small global memory. For a TPU design, you set the systolic array dimension to 128 by 128, and uh, you'd uh, configure the L1 memory and the global memory as appropriate. So there has been a lot of prior work in this space working on uh, our hardware architecture search, we're trying to find the best data path plus mapping combination. Um, we list some of them here. So we try to cover a wider set of data paths with our template, which is capable of covering uh, both scalar vector as well as matrix style processing elements with flexible memory hierarchies. By considering op fusion, we can address not just the compute, but also memory bandwidth bottlenecks. We can also use fast to optimize just single, not just single uh, workloads, but multiple workloads. And we're one of the first to show practicality through our return on investment analysis. A key relay work for us is Time Loop, which we actually integrate into our simulator. So Time Loop is an open source tool from Video Research and MIT. And it treats um, it focuses on, on mapping uh, convolutions onto Harvard data paths. So it treats a convolution as a seven-dimensional nested for loop. And since it's in this uh, format, you can then perform various transformations, such as uh, blocking or changing the order of the loops to represent different optimizations, which we've listed here. So what we did is that we took our in-house uh, architectural simulator, we modified it to enable it to model a wider range of architectures based on our data passer space as priorly, uh, previously discussed. So this fixes some of the main issues with time loop. So first of all, our architectural simulator models not just convolutions, but the full unmodified XLA HLO graphs. So when you compile a model using TensorFlow or PyTorch, you'll, if you look at the individual ops which are generated, you'll find that it's not just convolutions. There's a lot of 
other ops in there. And a lot of times these ops don't contribute much to overall performance, but sometimes they do. We want to model that. Uh, also, we can model compiler passes, such as tensor padding. And also, we can do uh, global graph optimizations, such as operation fusion. So because we're doing a search, we also need to model not just performance, but also power and area. So we have a pretty simple dynamic power model, uh, which we built to do this. So um, we have this memory model, which you know, when given a SRAM macro library, is able to pick the best uh, macro and uh, uh, for the given scratch pad dimensions. And um, we can model um, you know, a lot of the common components within a accelerator, such as you know, the systolic arrays, the scratch pads, the vector processing unit lanes, the uh, memory controllers, and PCI Express controllers, and the router nodes. So, this, if you look on the right, that shows a uh, TPU v2, I believe, um, from uh, one of the recent uh, Google papers. And we can uh, model the components highlighted in the orange. So that's a significant fraction of chip. There's still some things which are not modeled. Um, so we can then use this to, uh, we can also calculate a power provider's powers, uh, power, which is where we assume that each component is operating at 100% uh, utilization which you use to estimate TDP. So now let's discuss fast fusion. So uh, the way that uh, the XLA uh, programming model works is that each op um, is assumed to have its inputs and outputs being written to and read from uh, DRAM, from device DRAM. So if you have an op followed by another op, then it will write, the first op will write the output to DRAM and the next op will then read the same data which was just written back from DRAM and then perform the compute and write its output to DRAM. And to uh, avoid these unnecessary reads and writes, uh, we use Fusion. Uh, and um, But we want to be able to utilize our memory efficiently. So we proposed this new Fusion technique, which we call Fast Fusion, which can actually uh, fuse together the existing Fusion regions as created by XLA. So this will help us uh, utilize any spare uh, remaining global memory capacity to store these intermediate tensors. So we use an uh, integer linear programming a solution to this, and our ILP solver is actually able to directly minimize cycle count rather than some intermediate metrics such as the number of memory accesses. And we were able to do this with our simulator. So this is a very important component of search space because what this means is that you can actually uh, improve your effective memory bandwidth by increasing your global memory capacity, which will then therefore enable the LP solver to put move more tensors into global memory rather than having to write them out to DRAM. So this means that fast search can leverage our fusion technique to find the best balance between compute and, and uh, memory through um, by uh, balancing the need for more compute units versus more global memory for fusion. So now let's take a look at some of these emerging applications. So one important application is Efficient Net, which is a state-of-the-art convolutional neural network. So we profiled B7, which is the largest variant. So overall, we saw poor overall utilization, less than 15%, as a fraction of peak TPU v3 flops. So you can see here uh, on the um, graph to the right, we have profiled the individual uh, compute utilizing for each layer. And uh, as you can see, compute utilization grows as we move further down into the neural net. And this, that's because the earlier layers have lower utilization due, due to fewer input and output uh, channels. And so the number of channels increases as you go through a model and therefore utilization will rise. However, overall utilization is still very poor. A key culprit of this is these stepwise separable convolutions which are comprised of a depthwise convolution followed by a pointwise regular convolution. So if you look here on this table over here, uh, depthwise convolutions, despite comprising only 5% of total flat percent, they comprise around two thirds of the total runtime. On the other hand, convolutions, even though they comprise 95% uh, total flaps, they only are about one third of the total runtime. So to address this, we actually need to fix three bottlenecks. So one is that we need to find better uh, mappings to improve utilization for convolutions and device convolutions. 
Secondly, we can uh, improve utilization by changing the microarchitectural parameters, such as the systolic array dimensions. Thirdly, EfficientNet is actually uh, memory bound, it has very poor operational intensity. So we need really need to improve operational intensity. And one way to do this is through our uh, fusion technique. Now let's look at a popular neural uh, NLP based model, such as BERT. So conventional wisdom says that BERT already runs pretty efficiently on existing TPUs. So this is true, but only at lower sequence lengths. Those sequence lengths are a key hyperparameter in BERT. So you can see here on the lower left, uh, at sequence length 128, we achieve a very high compute utilization, but as we increase the sequence length, it quickly drops to about 20%. This is due to the BERT self-attention mechanism, which is known to run inefficiently on TPUs and GPUs. So unfortunately, this attention mechanism scales order n squared with sequence length. So we've uh, broken down BERT into its subcomponents, such as the QKV projection, the softmax self-attention, and feedforward components. So at sequence length 128, you can see that uh, total execution time is dominated by the feedforward layers in the QKV projections, which run efficiently on TPUs. However, when the sequence length increases, you can see that now, now that the opposite is true. The softmax and self-attention, which run inefficiently on TPUs, now dominate total execution time, thus leading to a very low overall compute utilization. So a common question that we get is, you know, is this type of custom accelerator design practical? So we all know that customizing further and further for a specific workload is going to lead to more speedups, but it's uh, unclear whether this is a good idea or not. So we analyzed, uh, to address this, we analyzed a return on investment, which is a common uh, metric used by uh, companies to determine profitability. So return on investment is simply the return divided by the investment. If its number is greater than one, then this is profitable. So for return, we define this as the um, benefit for using this new accelerator versus some baseline based on the total cost of ownership savings aka TCO. So total cost of ownership is comprised by the capital costs, aka the cost to purchase and deploy this accelerator, plus the length of deployment multiplied by the operational costs. So this includes things like the data center power provisioning, power costs, you know, etc. The investment is the cost of building this new accelerator, including labor, uh, you know, mass costs, IP licenses, etc. So TCO tends to be a very uh, proprietary uh, metric. And so we try to estimate this using only publicly available numbers as described in our paper. And we estimate a hypothetical accelerator's ROI relative to some uh, popular baseline. In this case, we chose the NVIDIA A100 uh, with the MSRP uh, costs. So we also assume uh, some smaller team sizes with modern design methodologies. This is all discussed in our paper. So this graph here, on the x-axis, we have the number of deployed accelerators. On the y-axis, we have ROI. And the break-even point is 1. So we evaluate on five different hypothetical accelerators, ranging from 1.5x to 100x per TCO. So two key observations. One is that any perf TCO positive accelerator will eventually become ROI positive. Conversely, nothing is ROI positive at very small deployment sizes. Also, because of how we define uh, return, there is significantly diminishing returns with improving TCO around 2 to 4x. So now let's go through our experimental setup. So we used Vizier, as discussed before, with 5,000 trials per experiment. We configured our simulator, as discussed here. We evaluated on a wide range of uh, computer vision models, as well as BERT. We also included some production models. So um, EfficientNet, obviously we valid that uh, from B0 to B7. These are different sizes for EfficientNet. We valid ResNet, uh, ResNet as a common CNN baseline. These two are production workloads. And we also evaluate BERT as sequence like 128 and 1024. Also, TDP is kind of a loaded term these days. And so we're going to assume for purposes of this study that TDP is power virus power. So, what we'd like to do is evaluate um, perf TCO, which is very important in um, for evaluating uh, data center uh, profitability. 
But uh, TCO is a sense of data, so instead we look at perf TDP, which is considered to be a very good approximation. So we evaluate uh, building custom fast accelerators relative to a TBV3 baseline on the same process technology. So each one of these points shows a, a certain workload. So for example, this one is efficient at V1. So this blue line right here shows the TPV3 baseline. The red line shows the same TPV3 baseline, but modeled with uh, fast scheduling and fusion. Finally, this green line right here shows fast search optimized for just this one workload. So for efficient at B1, for example. So these accelerators can run other workloads as well, but their uh, hyperparameters have been tuned to, uh, to execute this particular one very efficiently. We also have this multi-workload point where we optimize a single accelerator across multiple different workloads. So there are these yellow bars right here. Cross efficient at B7, resident 50, the OCR workloads in BERT with sequence length 1024. And here you can see that overall, we can have uh, more power efficient designs, not just when targeting single workloads, but also from targeting multiple workloads with only a small performance penalty. So let's take a quick look at where the performance is coming from. So in order to do this, we start with a TPV3 baseline. Uh, we only look at single core, and then we're going to incrementally add different changes to this until we add all the uh, techniques that we are proposing, which include both scheduling, data path, and fusion. So for example, right here, this point shows it for uh, efficient at B0. So here we have the blue shows the TPV3 baseline. Then we're going to incrementally add improved scheduling as found through time loop. So it's important to note that um, some of these schedules which are found by time loop may not be possible without hardware changes, changes to the control logic. So next, we add additionally uh, some data pass changes. So we change the TPU uh, 128 by 128 systolic arrays to um, 32 by 32 systolic arrays while keeping the total amount of compute constant. We also add a 128 megabyte global memory and we model this in our simulator. So this has a fairly, it looks right here that it has a fairly low amount of speed up, but this is uh, kind of deceiving. So uh, it actually achieves very high compute utilization, but the speed up is low because now it's memory bottlenecked. So once we add fusion on top of that, that removes the memory bottleneck. And so we see this really massive speed up. That doesn't mean that fast fusion itself is adding this massive speed up. It just means that uh, we now have a very efficient data path, which is found through fast. And, neuro, and it's, it's, it's memory bound, right? So we need to address both compute and memory in order to achieve very high overall speed up. So next, let's take a look at the same results. So this is the same um, figure as before, just with fewer points so I can fit on this page. And using the constants as discussed in the paper, we then calculated the ROI, uh, the number of chips that you need to deploy in order to reach a certain ROI target. So ROI one is the break-even point. So it's important to note that you know these are uh, publicly available numbers, and so rather than focusing on the exact values, uh, it's uh, the more important message is kind of the big picture, right? So uh, what this kind of shows is that these custom accelerators can potentially be profitable and practical at relatively small data center deployment sizes. So here are citations, and that's it for the entire talk. So thanks for listening. Uh, for any questions and comments, please contact me via uh, email, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Thank you.